Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Look Again, Group Dynamics Through a Feminist Lens. My name is Clara Longfellow, and I am a National Programs Officer here at the Girls Action Foundation. In a couple of minutes, I will be passing the mic along to Kit Mallow from COCO, the Center for Community Organizations. We are very fortunate to have her with us today. And I am happy to see some familiar names joining us for today's webinar. For those returning, welcome back. And for those who, of you who are new to our webinar series, I wanted to briefly introduce you to the Girls Action Foundation before passing things along to Kit. Very quickly, the Girls Action Foundation is a national nonprofit that works to empower girls. We are based in Montreal where we run local girls programs and we work with some 300 partners across the country who run their own girls programs. We also provide leadership training, organize networking events, and do other things that connect girls and young women. Just before introducing Kit, I'd like to walk you through the interactive side of today's webinar. You'll see on your screen a number of different information displays and panels that will be changing throughout the presentation. On the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see a panel window titled Q&A. Here is where you can ask questions and interact with Kit, myself, and other participants. If you have a question or comment during the presentation, type it into the Q&A box, hit enter, and it will be recorded there. By default, the question will be visible to everyone. If you would prefer to submit your question privately, click on the down arrow at the bottom of the Q&A box and select my colleague's name, Miriam Zadie, instead of all participants. The question will then come only to me. During Kit's presentation, she will be answering questions from the Q&A box, so feel free to ask your questions as they come. You don't have to save them until the end of the presentation. We will also be taking polls throughout the presentation that won't make, take more than a couple of minutes. I wanted to let you know that today's webinar is being recorded, including the question period. This will be posted online and we'll send everyone a link to the recording. Finally, at the end of the webinar, a survey will pop up. Please fill it out. We'd love to read your feedback. With that covered, I'd like to introduce Kit. Kit Mallow is a learning consultant and community facilitator who works at the Center for Community Organizations, also known as COCO. Through her work with groups, she encourages culture of change for the purpose of sustainable practices and communities. In today's webinar, Kit will guide participants through an exploration of the fusion between organizational development and gender empowerment. Okay, so I'm thrilled to be here with uh, the Girls Action Foundation Network today to talk about uh, what I hope is going to be a really important and interesting topic, um, or at least I think it's important whether or not it's interesting will be up to you to decide. But we're focusing on uh, looking at group dynamics through a feminist lens. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why I chose this as a webinar theme. But before I do that, I'd like to first just describe a little bit what my organization is and what we do. So I work for an organization called COCO, which is a funny acronym for the Center for Community Organization uh, that works out a little bit better in French, the Centre des Organisations Communautaires. Um, but we're a provincial nonprofit that works um, with English-speaking bilingual um, and what we call uh, ethnocultural organizations, although that term is one that we uh, struggle with quite a bit for many different uh, complex reasons. But at any rate, um, the intention behind our organization is to help promote healthy structures and governance and internal health of uh, the organization itself, so the group, not the individual, in order to promote community sector development for social change. Um, so that being said, we use a social justice framework, which means that a lot of our strategic directions focus on things like anti-oppression, uh, and we try to think about how uh, forms of power play out in not just individual uh, encounters, but also in systemic ways. Uh, and when we're looking at the, the health of a group, which is what we're here to talk about today, group dynamics, uh, through this type of feminist lens, 
uh, when we're looking at that health, uh, it's important for us to consider uh, these systemic issues, not just the um, uh, more uh, a different way of looking at it in more individual context. Um, so, so why this topic? So now that you have a sense of who I am and, and where I work, um, I'd like to, to tell you a little bit more about how this particular topic touches me in my life. Um, I think it's important to ground um, this talk within uh, that type of context. So. Um, it's funny here because the image that I picked for this, uh, I was Googling um, oblivious and this is one of the images that came up and I thought, oh, that's kind of hilarious because it's uh, a white man in a suit with his head in the sand. And it really spoke to my story, which was that, that my master's uh, was in uh, at a program where we were working um, on how to become practitioners that are consultants with groups um, on their own dynamics, both process and task. And it's a master's called Human Systems Intervention at Concordia. It's a really complex, interesting field of study, but one of the things that I discovered for myself personally was that there, uh, the theories and practices of how to bring those theories to life and how to work with groups we're missing something very key for me. And that was that practitioners and theorists that I was encountering um, in the work uh, of, of the school, um, not necessarily the professors as much as the actual information that we were learning, um, made a number of assumptions of the organization that basically their gender, race, and class neutral. Um, so I didn't find that this was actually helpful at all to my own personal practice. I didn't find that thinking about uh, how group dynamics function uh, can be uh, stripped of these systemic issues uh, and these personal issues. And something I've experienced myself as um, someone who has my own experience with these uh, forms of uh, systemized um, power and privilege um, structures, uh, but it's also something that I, I, I saw and see in many of the people I work with. And so I was trying to figure out how to negotiate this missing gap, and it was almost like there was this obliviousness um, in all that we were talking about to this reality. It seems very, um, there was this sort of utopic notion that if you use the right tools and have the right conversations, the group will naturally become this democratic, um, naturally create this democratic uh, dynamic that uh, I think is a, a lovely, beautiful, somewhat um, naive thought to have. Uh, so, but there wasn't a lot of uh, information out there to help me buffer this experience with um, actually starting to think more about uh, organizational development and group dynamics from the perspective of, of power and system systemic oppression. There's really a current lack or gap in the research, and there, while there is some people that talk about it, they're on the margins of my field, and so it's definitely not something that necessarily as groups um, you're going to be able to access if you're working with someone on your organizational health. Which brings me to you. So, so I was, I, I've been, you know, talking a lot about my own personal journey through. Um, the world of group dynamics and, and some of the questions that I had around this. Um, and, I, and I really wanted to speak to you as to maybe why you might be here. So I wanted to just see, um, do a little poll uh, right now in terms of what role describes you best. You can see that um, you, know, you work at a nonprofit, you work at a profit organization, are you an individual with just interest in this topic, or uh, do you work as a, as a consultant and intervener and you're curious to know how to bring this topic more to life? Um, so I'll just give you um, a minute to answer that. Okay, so it looks like the majority of you, uh, which is not surprising considering that, you know, we're working with Girls Action Foundation and I myself work at a nonprofit, that 63% of you work uh, in a nonprofit organization. There's a few of you that work at profit organizations, 4%. 22% um, have identified themselves as individuals interested in this topic. Uh, not necessarily associated with um, a, um, a particular organization, and 19% work with groups as uh, consultants and 
interviewers um, of the people that answered the question. So, so you're a really varied mix of people, which is awesome, um, uh, and that is very, um, I think, pertinent to the topic because, in my mind, this is a topic that uh, touches um, all of us in all of the different areas in which we work and uh, live, not just in certain sectors. Uh, I think that we have different perspectives on these things given um, our different organizational mandates, but that in terms of it being an overall issue, it's definitely something that I think power dynamics and issues of um, looking at things from a feminist perspective touch all of our groups. So this webinar is really here to take a look at, at some of those overarching uh, um, questions that that come up in, in all these different types of things. So the first one is is again uh, we're looking at it from a fairly general perspective, which is when people get together and work with one another, what power dynamics uh, uh, arise? You know, so the, the, there's really a notion here that whether you're informal or you're structured, whether you say you're working in a uh, non-hierarchical environment or more of a traditional um, uh, hierarchical environment that there are power dynamics and that these power dynamics um, come from a, a variety of sources but that they're important to look at. So a second question that this webinar explores is do our current models and practices of organizational and professional development take power dynamics into account? And I have a bias here. I, I think that the answer to that is no. Um, so I guess that exploration of that question is pretty short. Uh, but 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 really, I think it's an important one to keep asking ourselves because um, I have found as a practitioner that this is not the case, um, at least not in concrete ways. Uh, and I also think that as we hopefully move towards this being more the case, it still needs to be on the table because it's actually not really something that's going to be resolved. The notion of power and the notion of uh, how we work with power isn't suddenly, isn't a problem to be solved, it's a reality that we need to balance. And so I think that, that that's the spirit from which these questions are coming, not necessarily as in how two plus two is four, but more these questions need to be on the table so that we continue to, to work together on these, on these important uh, topics. And so the final goal is to explore the question of how do we as groups that are passionate about issues of gender and power use this feminist lens when considering our organization our organizational growth? Um, you know, that's more of a concrete. So this 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 webinar is more of an introduction to the concept. So there's going to be more of a conceptual analysis of some of these things. And I think that um, you know, in future conversations, what would be exciting is to talk more concretely about how this actually can play out in our organizations and in our group. So before we get into what I mean by some of, of uh, or a further exploration of those questions, I wanted to root the conversation in a context of what I'm defining as feminism in this particular uh, situation. Because I think it's like any term, uh, you know, looking at group dynamics through a feminist lens, it can mean so many different things. So, you know, one of the one of the definitions that I really find myself gravitating towards is this one by Bell Hooks, who is a teacher and a pedagogical um, activist. Uh, and she she writes here that feminism is a movement to end sexism, sexist exploitation, and oppression. And the reason why I think that this is an important way to look at feminism is because it opens up the conversation to be more than just men and women. It opens up the conversation more to just how are women oppressed or uh, that there's this dichotomy um, between the two that somehow is at the root of things. Um, it opens it up to look at more how gender expression is um, imagined, realized, uh, judged, performed, perceived, um, and the privilege and the power that certain gender expressions get. Um, so, so it really opens up not only the definition, but also the potential for us in terms of how we can work with this definition um, as facilitators, consultants, practitioners, and as people who are um, staff or volunteers uh, and others in, in groups and in uh, nonprofits. And then, and then the other point about this 
definition that I thought was important is this term oppression. Um, because this talk is really specific about feminism um, and about the feminist lens, um, but I think that the term oppression is really important because it does speak to uh, the intersectionality of these things uh, and how other components of who we are and how we're perceived by other people um, relate to uh, the power and privilege that we interact with in our daily lives. And so that feminism is more than just women and men, again, in the sense that it looks at or acknowledges the fact that there's an intersectionality um, around these issues. So, yeah, pretty, you know, light stuff. No, uh, you know, like uh, a pop song. There's, actually, there's probably a pop song about that. But anyway, um, so, yeah, I mean, th th this, like I said, this is very conceptual stuff, but, but there is something that's really um, concrete about it as well, because we're really looking at how does, how do these concepts, how does this notion of feminism uh, change how we think about um, our relationships in organizations um, and the systemic power issues that, that go on um, in them. So, you know, just to give you a really quick example to maybe make it a bit more day-to-day -day, um, uh, for the people listening, um, you know, there's there's been many times where as a really vocal uh, person who takes, and I take up um, space, you know, I have to think about how is my taking up space uh, potentially meaning someone else can't, but at the same time, I had one example where I was working once where um, a man in my organization approached me at the end of a uh, staff meeting and mentioned that he had a problem with how much space I was taking up, and, and my actual amount of uh, points on the agenda was always the, the least amount, and so, you know, I questioned him about it and said, if I if I was a man, would you be asking me this question? Would you be commenting on the amount of space I take up? Like, is there a gender dynamic issue going on here? And I and I tried to do it in a way that was sort of open and curious, but it's intense to to, to ask that question, to have it be asked me, to think about these questions in relationship to other ways in which uh, I identify and I'm seen. So. It's obviously very complex, but there's ways in which these things play out on a day-to-day -day, uh, that we often don't think about um, because we do get used to the, um, modes of behavior within our organizations and modes of um, where we fit. And so if I fit in a certain level of power, um, if I challenge that, I can feel threatened just myself because I have an internalized sense of where I should be placed within the context of, of my work environment. Um, so this is actually an approach to organizations that, that has been around the shortest amount of time. So this, this whole notion of a feminist approach to organizational development or group dynamics has only been um, in literature or in organizational work um, since the 1990s. And so a lot of the uh, organizational management from uh, days of yore do not have um, any type of uh, this framework in mind when they're talking about how groups work together. And so it really misses a large component of the reality of uh, the North American at any rate context. Um, so we've looked at what feminism is from, from the perspective of this webinar, and, and we've looked at the perspective of feminism as it relates to organizational development in, in group dynamics uh, in the webinar. And now it, I think it would be interesting to just quickly look at the two main areas of group dynamics that my program talks about um, and that we think about when we're talking about how groups relate to one another. And so you'll see here that there's an image and uh, I'm going to just ask people here another polling question just to see, but if you were going to look at this uh, image and, and answer what are they doing, what's the task that these people are doing, um, how would you respond? So I'll give you a minute for that. Okay, so pretty much everybody said that they are building a structure. Um, you are brilliant geniuses, each and every one of you, because that is true. Barn raising, construction of a building, they seem to be trying to build something, working together to build something. So yeah, everybody's got uh, the right idea. They are building a bar. Um, awesome. I will give you all my five, um, but I can't, uh, so I won't, but I am on my. So, then you see that in the next slide, it is the same picture. But in this 
picture, I am asking, um, you know, what is the process? How, how are they doing this? Um, and we don't necessarily have enough time to actually ask this question of you, uh, but I think that one of the things that's really interesting is that we often forget as groups to think about the process of how we do something. So it's easy for us to say, okay, we're building a barn together, this is the task, but the process, how we do it is maybe um, a little bit more subtle or tacit at times. Um, you know, and there's lots of you know, reasons that are very understandable for that. It's maybe not something we're familiar doing, we're culturally speaking in, in the, the places that I've been in my life anyway in, in North America, we tend to focus more on how to get things done, or sorry, what, sorry, not how to get things done, the opposite actually, uh, what we're getting done, not how to get things done. Um, but the how is actually one of the one of the most important parts of food dynamics, and and this is where we get into some of the more um, uh, nuanced understandings of power and privilege and how these things work. Like. So even in this picture, what I found interesting was that the women and the men are very separate, and it speaks to uh, the roles in which people have uh, for this task, and whether or not it's just for the camera or it's actually how things were being played out uh, within the actual task of building the structure, there's a clear delineation um, between uh, who does what um, based on a lot of assumptions probably about uh, ability and interest and capacity and uh, cultural normalcy around uh, how we go about doing things. Um, and so this is, this is, you know, obviously a picture from uh, maybe the 1920s or 30s, so it's in the past, and it's fairly, uh, you know, a lot of the tasks that we do in our group dynamics aren't quite as clear as building the barn. And so it's, it's more to give an example of the fact that the task um, might be easy to explain, but when we look at the process, we can start seeing how some of these dynamics uh, come out and in terms of who does what and how. Um, and these are conversations that we have more and more, um, but there's lots of subtle ways in which uh, the role in which I'm supposed to play is reinforced and the role that you're supposed to play is reinforced in very um, quiet ways or ways in which we're made to feel uncomfortable talking about. And, and, and the fact that in, in organizational development, there isn't a large body of tools or practices that help encourage us to talk about these things mean they stay somewhat um, passive. And what this does is it really prevents, in my mind, again, this is a bias that I have, uh, not talking about these things prevents uh, the creative work mode. And the creative work mode is when there's this amazing uh, connection between process and task, where there's really a sense of coming together and working in a way that feels very organic and uplifting and joyous. And so I just wanted to see um, how many people here have had a work experience where ideas flowed easily, people worked together with passion, and the creativity um, and the outcome was amazing. So that there's something about not only how you're working together, but also the product that comes out of it that just sort of almost blows your mind. I'm just going to see, uh, take your time to answer that there. Yeah, so, so we're back, and, and we see that um, you know, the, in terms of how often people have this experience, 7% of you uh, experience this all the time, which is amazing. 60% um, uh, said that they do occasionally, uh, and uh, one person uh, said no, uh, and then other people were unsure. So, so it's clear that this is something that most of us have experienced um, at some point in our life, but it's not necessarily a guarantee. It's not a given that these two tasks and processes are going to come together and offer us this creative work mode. Um, and oftentimes in creative work mode, that's where we feel the most ourselves. We're like seeing fully for, not necessarily fully, but a lot more fully for who we are outside of or with uh, the, the constraints of identifiers, but that that's not the main reason why we're here together. Um, and so that creative work mode is a fairly special uh, space to be and, and theirs, but it's not necessarily one that's all experienced frequently. And the reason why is because there's certain processes that inhibit or encourage the task. Um, so all of the things that are listed here, like 
conflicts in formal and formal communication, decision-making processes, level of trust, clarity, and general notions of power we are all the same. So this is looking from a more traditional group dynamic perspective. If we're seeing, okay, how to get here to the creative work mode, these are the issues that are process issues for the how we do things that help us or, or really uh, put a wrench in the work uh, to, to, in terms of the task happening. Um, so we see here that in this list, um, there's nothing good or bad. It's more just, is this something that's working? Like, are we working with it well or not? But that the last point is the one that I really want to um, highlight here, because in the more traditional group dynamic and organizational development perspective, there's this notion that uh, power is something that we can really work on in, without having to talk about uh, systemic oppression, without having to acknowledge uh, is, like, a, a more feminist perspective uh, that, that groups don't start inherently democratic and that, that there's actually more going on than just uh, certain people taking up more space or having more control. Um, that there's something deeper going on in terms of how we relate to one another in, given this cultural context. Um, so if we look at the same set of group issues that inhibit the creative work mode or that encourage the creative work mode, from a feminist lens, we see that um, a lot of the things here are the same. So there's conflict still. How do you work with conflict? There's communication, both formal and informal. There's decision-making processes, trust, clarity, and power. But the difference between the power from the feminist lens and from the traditional lens is that the feminist lens actually acknowledges that power is uh, individual, political, and systemic. And so that there's something about power that's not just about the individuals in the group um, and that, you know, the group itself has to work out their issues of power. It actually looks at, okay, there's political and systemic issues of power that also play into um, our process that also will inhibit or encourage creative work mode from happening if we don't acknowledge them. So I think that that's a really important difference between the two. Because these group issues are actually issues that we see all the time in um, our uh, experiences with each other. Um, but it's, it's how we look at power that really um, opens up a different type of way of engaging in group dynamics. Um, so then what do we do to reinforce these group dynamics um, and these group issues? Uh, there's, there's really, you know, for the sake of uh, clarity and for the sake of uh, being concise, but I also think this is like a fairly helpful way of looking at it. There's two different ways that organizationally we, we reinforce these group dynamics. One is through our structures and one is through our relationships. And so when, we, when we're looking at our structures, a lot of people here are in, um, in nonprofits, and so you know uh, that there's uh, a need for governance, policies and procedures, accountability measures, job descriptions, role clarity, established cultural norms that are explicit. Um, you know, and then also what, what we say versus what we do. So sometimes you can have an organizational structure that uh, reinforces a group dynamic or a group way of being that actually acknowledges power. Um, you, ha you say that you have that structure, you might even have that structure in place, but if you don't actually use it, are you really doing it? So a good example of that might be an organization that has um, a human resource policy that comes from a feminist perspective, um, but that it's not necessarily enforced, or um, a desire to have a certain type of structure in terms of governance that's more democratic, but the actual way in which it plays out is not actually what people are saying. It does. So there's a real uh, fine, finessing, um, lived experience of how these things actually play out in our day to day um, and how they reinforce certain dynamics or create others. And then obviously, you know, our, our organizational relationships also um, speak in terms of, you know, do we have um, transparency with their commitment? Uh, how do we relate to control? Um, the established cultural norms that are a little bit more tacit and the, the hierarchies that are more cultural as opposed to structural, um, the hierarchies that are reinforced more through our behavior than through the actual 
structures that we put in place to help define that behavior. So there's only a few minutes left, and, and what I'd like to do is just before we uh, we end, take a look at um, what happens when we don't apply a feminist lens to group dynamics and what happens when we do. And then the last few slides are going to be about um, just getting concrete and looking at uh, how to actually put the feminist lens into uh, play when we're looking at both structures and relationships. So what happens when we don't apply a feminist lens to group dynamics? Uh, organizational structures and relationships don't take into account these uh, systemic issues of oppression that we've been talking about. We, we often adjust, though, and this is, I think, a really important point, is that we're, we're used to getting our work done. We're used to being in organizations or in group settings where these types of uh, power dynamics exist. So it's not necessarily, and it's also very uncomfortable sometimes to be the person who's feeling this type of um, power and differentiation and, and, and know how to uh, bring it up. So, so a question, for instance, from one of the people uh, um, in the webinar uh, from Emma Legault was uh, that she's an educator um, in, a, in an environment where mo most of the people are uh, female dominated, it's, it, but except for the leaders, which are disproportionately male. And she asked, how can organizations adopt practices and engage in discussions that help the surface these subconscious biases? Um, because she's suspecting a lot of this is subconsciously driven. And this, this, her question really speaks to this point, is that it becomes really difficult to bring these things up, especially if you feel like, you know, in doing so, uh, you're becoming just an annoying, whiny woman, or uh, there can be that sense of, I don't want to have to take this on. This isn't necessarily my responsibility. And, so there's, there's ways in which um, these things uh, uh, become embedded in systems. And so in order to deal with it, we just we kind of like accept that that's the way that it is, uh, even if it's not always the most fun. Um, and again, because organizational development doesn't have a lot of literature or tools that specifically talk about this, there's no space where we can normalize this um, for our colleagues without being uh, without it becoming quite personal often. Uh, so, so the thing is, is that um, the outcomes are less awesome, I think, and that full, full creative mode um, does not happen. And so going back to this image of the creative work mode, in, in systems that don't uh, apply a feminist lens, I think that it can be uh, a little bit less uncomfortable for certain people, but I think that the end result can be a little bit less rich. Um, and that's just focusing on the process and the task. It's, it's not necessarily, uh, the experience isn't as full as it can possibly be. Um, so what happens when we can't, what, what can happen when we apply a feminist lens to the dynamics? So if we were to take this typical way of doing things uh, where we don't apply a feminist lens for many reasons and we start actually changing that and shifting it to apply a feminist lens. And so this image that I picked uh, speaks to this kinetic electric energy of beingness that can emerge, uh, I think, when we actually take the time to learn about and to work with each other in, in a way that acknowledges um, these uh, levels of oppression and how they impact um, us as individuals and us as um, and I think that what happens is organizations develop more equitable relationships and structures. And so there's this acknowledgement um, and desire to work to shift power, um, and not just for the sake of the individual, but also for the sake of the, the, the whole at large. And so there's, again, that acknowledgement that this is uh, not just a one-on-one -on -one problem. It's a problem that touches uh, our structures and our systems and, and the greater context. Um, and this allows for free expression in movement. Whenever our relationships and structures shift in ways that allow uh, greater accessibility then there is a freer uh, expression that, that um, comes to life. And movement isn't necessarily physical. It's more in the way in which we can express who we are, express our ideas. And that gets more to the process and the task, because I think that this might um, potentially seem um, a little bit of a jump, but I actually believe that the, our creative work mode uh, is much more possible to achieve, and we have way more uh, awesome outcomes when we feel acknowledged and when not only ourselves as individuals, but when, when we feel like the, the structures that we're working in and the relationships that we're working in actually acknowledge power that goes beyond 
uh, just the immediate group dynamic, and that actually uh, ethically calls into question um, uh, transforming the possibilities of, of, of power within our work. I think that, that gives people a real um, accessibility to themselves and to each other that you can't get otherwise. Um, so, so yeah, there's been a lot of material in the past 33 minutes, and so um, I really appreciate all of us spending this um, concentrated time together, really thinking about uh, this this lens and how it works. And so, I, I would just like to leave you with a few uh, slides about getting concrete, because we have been talking, as I said earlier, fairly conceptually, and um, I think that in order to begin the process of understanding this or thinking about it, it's important to get some of the histories and the concepts down. Um, but at the same time, I think it's really important to stay practical, too, because one of the reasons why I started thinking about this was because I was frustrated by the lack of practical knowledge that I had in terms of how to uh, bring this to my work, and it's something that I still struggle with, actually. Um, so, you know, I was thinking about if we think about the two... Uh, uh, dynamics that give rise to group uh, issues, structure, and relationship, um, I thought, okay, you know, maybe we can give some examples of the concrete in terms of the feminist lens and action in both. So if we think about structure, uh, you know, things that come to mind is governance approaches that challenge the status quo traditional models. So traditional models often suggest that systemic imbalances don't exist. How do we, is it, how can we take our organizations and develop structures that really actually uh, acknowledge that systemic, that, that systemic imbalances exist and that don't even necessarily look to eradicate them, but to look to balance um, our, our way of acknowledging them in order to slowly uh, change that in a more sustainable way. So I think the idea of trying to like rip the band-aid off and remove these things is uh, kind of probably a little bit uh, over the top and often doesn't work and then you get frustrated because you're like, oh my God, we're trying to be like super non-hierarchical and it's just not working. It's like, you know, there's ways to approach this where you can still acknowledge that power exists, but it's like, you know, even in the acknowledgement, there's uh, a whole opening that emerges from that. Um, the feminist lens of action in terms of group structure concretely also can um, relate to participatory decision-making processes. So that happens in terms of, for instance, uh, systems of, of rotating leadership. So, at COCO, uh, for instance, we have uh, four different roles that we have in every meeting, and people take turns doing that. And it's it's surprising how often um, groups are are hesitant and resistant to trying that because, uh, in my mind, because it's something that can really offer an ability to be more open and to start having these conversations and feeling different um, modes of. Uh, uh, leadership and power in different groups, but at the same time, it's also can be really uncomfortable and new, and maybe not so uh, familiar to people, which which uh, can, can shake things up. And so, it's something to definitely play with, though I think, in terms of the concrete action that we can take. Uh, also, flexible job designs, equitable systems of income, interpersonal political accountability, which is um, very easy to say, but very difficult to do. And then policies and procedures that acknowledge these systemic powers and support um, an intersection work for each other. And then if you look at relationships, um, I think that, you know, if we get concrete with relationships in terms of the feminist lens in action, uh, to start emphasizing things like plurality, uh, paradox, contradiction, um, you know, how much do we have to actually understand uh, about one another to work with one another? There's, there's often this obsession of I have to know everything about you in order to be with you or work with you. And I think that that's something that concretely can challenge in our group relationships and move these things forward and offer a space where uh, a level of diversity uh, that is as complex as it, uh, we actually experience uh, can be brought to life more. Um, and then the other the other things here, commitment to employee growth, power sharing, acknowledging and working at identifying systemic issues. Um, I think that the last two might actually be the most important in terms of taking a learning organization approach. Because as we, we've been talking about, uh, you know, oppression and power isn't something that's going to go away. And it's, and it's something that uh, we need to learn to work uh, with uh, in order to start shifting in ways that are much more healthy. And so I think that taking on a learning organization approach to these things and making a commitment organizationally in your relationships to actually have this be one of the values in which you uh, uh, put energy towards is a really good uh, stepping stone to some of these actions. 
Um, so I'm just going to take some time for a few more questions. Uh, let's see, there was somebody who was saying, uh, asking about uh, non-hierarchical structures not being uh, really that non-hierarchical. And I think that when I talk about non-hierarchical or collective structures, um, I am acknowledging the fact that there's still hierarchies within those. And so it goes back to the whole notion of uh, the notion of power and the notion of hierarchy become a problem to be fixed, but it's more um, a situation to be balanced and to be worked with in order to have a healthy system. So I hope that helps. Um, and then there's someone else who, Anne-Marie Angers Trottier, who asked a similar question to Emma Legault, uh, saying that a lot of her work is political. She works in, in areas where politicians are mostly older men. She deals with a lot of sexism and power struggles. Any tips or references to help me navigate through this? Um, and, you know, I think that, that one of the things that's really difficult is when we feel isolated and alone in these things. And so, again, you know, there's things that people can do personally, but one of the things that I also think we need to do, and this is one of the reasons why I think this webinar, for me, uh, I have a coup de coeur when I think about this topic, is because our structures don't help support us in these things at all. And I think that structurally speaking, a lot needs to change in terms of that. And so, um, it's, it's, you know, if you're, if you're in an environment where the structures don't support that, um, it's interesting to look at, you know, what, who are the people that you can, that can help impact that change and how can you get involved in that, uh, change and so that it's not necessarily just coming from you as an individual, but it becomes more, um, organizational because I think that that's where, um, the real shift is going to happen. But um, unfortunately, I don't have any um, more time to, to answer your questions, and I also recognize that they're fairly complex, and, and they are about some, something that I think would be a next step to talk about, which is more in our specific work environment, how we bring these concepts to life. So I want to thank all of you for being um, here to share in this topic. I hope that um, it's been a fruitful uh, time for you in terms of listening and reflecting upon your own uh, organizations in your own practice. And I'm really, really excited about this topic. So um, I would, and a few last things because I like talking forever and ever. Talking is one of my favorite things. Um, uh, here are some resources that you can take a look at. Uh, and the first two, um, actually the first four uh, are academic um, papers, et cetera that I think you can get off the internet without having to pay, um, cause that's important because they can be expensive otherwise. Um, or you can just Google these people's names to see if you can get a little bit of a sense of who they are. They are organizational development folks who look at the feminist lens. Um, but you know, like I, I said before, well, there's a lot of resources that are academic or focused on feminist organizations, so organizations that have feminist specific mandates uh, in terms of what they do. There's not a lot of um, information out there uh, for organizations that don't have a feminist specific mandate but still want to work in a feminist way or things that are kind of outside of the academic world. But there is a project on COCO's website called Puff Uber, which was a project all about anti-oppression policies in the workplace. And there's lots of videos. Sorry, I'm eating salad. This is probably, yeah, you can hear that. It's pretty good. It's a radish. Anyway. You can take a look out on Coco's website and see that. So, and then the only last thing I wanted to do was show you a tree and give you my contact information. So, please do get in touch if you have questions or comments or uh, you want to talk about this further and, and, and it's something that your organization is doing, I would love to hear from you. Okay, over and out. I'm going to go finish my food. Have a great day. That's all the time we have for the presentation today. Thank you so much, Kit, for that wonderful presentation. And to find out more on this topic, check out our publications in our online resource center on our website. You can also visit our website at www.girlsactionfoundation.ca, and you can view our past webinars and like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter at underscore girls action. Again, a thank you for attending and a thank you to Kit for being with us here today. Have a great day, everyone.